Little by little, during the late 1800s, it just built up and built up. In the 1870s, however, they had a big problem. The greenheads, which we know so much about, and the mosquitoes were so common that people were no longer wanting to stay away from the trains. And so they literally had to go through the whole north and two-thirds of the island and fill in all the creeks and all the swamps. And so with that, the 30 to 50 foot mountain range of sand dunes that stretched the whole length of the island were all leveled and the island was filled out and the mosquitoes and greenheads moved off to the bays. And at that point, yeah, they just kept on building hotels to the point that when you get to 1900, there were four different railroads yeah, with daily service coming into Atlantic City. The hotels were starting to be opened all year round and it was a booming resort. As early as 1765, Reuben Tucker had realized he could make a profit by providing comfortable accommodations for visitors to the Jersey Shore. Between 1800 and 1850, shore towns would become more than just settlements. Along the coast, New Jersey's first seaside resorts began to develop. The first overland trips to the shore were often made in freight wagons, also known as Jersey wagons. Traders carried salted fish and oysters from Little Egg Harbor to Philadelphia and Trenton. On their return, they would often bring back visitors to the coast. These early pioneer travelers brought with them tents, stoves, blankets, and food. Being a long, hot, rigorous journey, by the time they reached their destination, voracious greenhead flies may have made one continuous meal of them. By 1816, stagecoach lines were operating between Philadelphia and Tuckerton. Making one round trip a week, it took two days to travel each way. Soon, lines to Absecon and Leeds Point were being added for Atlantic County. Travel by boat to the Cape Peninsula was a slightly more pleasant trip. In 1802, sailboats were carrying freight and passengers down the Delaware River from Philadelphia. By 1823, the first steamboat was making excursions between the two destinations. Travel by boat was bringing more visitors from New York to Long Branch also. At first, New Yorkers took a ship to Red Bank, then a six-mile stage to Long Branch. Later, a steamboat company offered service between New York and Sandy Hook. Up to 60 stagecoaches would carry passengers down the sea island to the resort. By the 1830s, boats were docking directly at Long Branch. Early visitors to the shore often stayed in farmhouses that took in a few guests, or in boarding houses that were scattered along the coast. A common menu offered by proprietors might include chicken, fish, potatoes, and oysters. The oysters were often free to eat as many as you could open. In the 1820s, travelers to Long Beach took a stagecoach to Tuckerton, then boarded a boat the next day for the island. Fare for the crossing was 25 cents. 
At the south end of the island stood the Philadelphia House. It was said to have a rather shoddy appearance, but its reputation was that of good cheer. Top-notch food and liquor made up for its lack of elegance. Men bathers would walk a half mile to reach the beach, while ladies rode in horse-drawn carts. With no bathhouses then, guests went behind the dunes to change into their bathing clothes. Up near the center of the island, the Mansion of Health opened in 1822. In 1815, the Herring Hotel was built within present-day Island Beach State Park. It was said to have an 80-foot by 40-foot dance hall. They served Jersey Lightning, the popular liquor of choice at the time. And for a dollar a night, you could ride horses, go fishing, hunting, crabbing, or pick cranberries. In 1816, Joseph Wardell purchased a parcel of land at Atlanticville, what is today North Long Branch. He built Fish Tavern on the property, later enlarging it to 60 rooms and calling it Land's End. A local newspaper wrote in 1834, there are several boarding houses at the seaside town of Deal, where some 50 to 100 persons may be comfortably accommodated. In the 1840s, at Ryan's Boarding House on Absecon Island, festive beachgoers often danced the night away. Near the present-day town of Mantaloking, there was Uncle Jakey's Tavern. It is said to have been built in 1811. And in 1815, Thomas Hughes built the first Congress Hall in Cape May. A great rambling wooden structure with 100 rooms. When it opened, it had neither paint on the outside nor plaster on the inside. Laughingly known as Tommy's Folly, visitors filled his folly to the rafters. With its majestic colonnades, balconies, and verandas, Congress Hall is still entertaining guests today. The Grand Dame of resort hotels. A year after Jeremiah Lee's death in 1838, his second wife Millicent opened a tavern inn called Aunt Millie's Boarding House. Thus, the first business in Atlantic City was born. By 1850, there were seven permanent dwellings on the island. All but one were owned by descendants of Jeremiah Leeds. And down at Reuben Tucker's farmhouse, his widow was continuing the innkeeping tradition on Tucker's Beach. By 1875, a canal about two miles wide, separating Long Beach from Tucker's Beach, and at one time deep enough to be navigated by ships, had gradually filled in. You could now walk from Long Beach to Tucker's Island. These hardy pioneer innkeepers could never have imagined the changes that were about to occur on these wild, untamed, 
dune-covered islands. By the mid-19th century, larger establishments were being built up and down the coast. From Beach Haven to Spring Lake, many of the modest farmhouses that had been taking in guests were being converted or replaced by bigger and more formidable structures. Cape May had six boarding houses by 1834, and places like Ocean Beach and Long Branch were gaining notoriety. This was the first step towards bringing luxury accommodations to the Jersey Shore. But it wasn't until the period following 1850 that hotels would reach their peaks of elegant hospitality. <laughs>